So, the Da Vinci Code. Millions of people have read this book, and polls have shown that about 36% of people who read it think it's all true. So they've estimated about 20 million people in the world at the moment believe the Da Vinci Code is true.、Uh, so what we're looking at today is mistakes in the code, mistakes in the book. And you might think, well, why would you bother? But I'll show you why. It is quite important. This is the book, the Da Vinci Code. And first thing I want to point out is, see where the green arrow is. You see how it says a novel. Now, a novel means it's a work of fiction, which means it's not true. It's a story that someone's made up, just like stories about fairies and Hansel and Gretel and all them kind of things, Jack and the Beanstalk. But you see how small the words are where it says a novel. So a lot of people have kind of missed that, and they don't realise it's a novel, and they think it's a true,、uh, not so a true story, but they think there's a lot of history in it, as if it's a history book that you'd read at school. But If it is a history book, it's a very badly written history book, and we know that by looking at the title. If you look at the blue arrow, where it says the Da Vinci Code, straight away that should send alarm bells in your head, because the word Da Vinci, the two words Da Vinci, they're being used in completely the wrong way. Throughout this book, this guy Dan Brown, and you'll see it in the film as well, they refer to Leonardo Da Vinci. As Da Vinci all the time. Now, Da Vinci just means he's from the town of Vinci. It's not his surname, but throughout the book, he calls him Da Vinci. Now, I'm Duncan. I'm from Wandsworth. If people called me Duncan from Wandsworth, that would be acceptable. But then, if people just started saying, "Oh, you know, from Wandsworth. I heard that from Wandsworth he'd done this," and you'd think, "What are you talking about?" And the same with the Da Vinci Code. Every time you hear them say Da Vinci on their own, you got to think, "What kind of research has Dan Brown done?" Because it isn't a surname. Now, check it out. On the first page of the book, this is what it says: All descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals in this novel are accurate. So he's claiming all these things are accurate. So yeah, he's made up a story, but every time he talks about a painting, every time he talks about a building, and every time he talks about a document, he claims that that part is true. And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to go through artwork, architecture, and we're going to go through documents. I'm not going to talk about secret rituals because I don't really know anything about secret rituals.、Uh, we're just going to cover these first three. So to start off with, let's look at the artwork. Now remember, he's saying all descriptions of artwork in this novel are accurate. So check it out. You've all seen this painting before, the Mona Lisa, right? In the book and in the film. They make out that Leonardo da Vinci painted this and then called it Mona Lisa, and he says that that was an anagram of two names. One's called Amon, and the other is Isis, and they're two different gods.、Uh, he's claiming that Leonardo da Vinci put this as like a secret code, so that people later on could see Mona Lisa, change around the letters, and then come up with the god Amon and the god Isis. One's a male god, one's a female god. Uh, there's a big problem with this, right? Leonardo never called it Mona Lisa. You might be shocked to hear that, but Leonardo never named any of his paintings. The name comes from a guy called Giorgio Vasari, and 31 years after Leonardo's death, he did a biography on Leonardo, and he called this painting Mona Lisa. What's interesting as well is. Really, Mona Lisa. The way we write it in English is a misspelling. There should be two ends in the Mona. It's an abbreviation of the, the、uh, Italian Madonna, My Lady. Now, if there's two ends in it, the anagram doesn't work with Amon because there's only one N in Amon. So this is just one crucial mistake in the film. This is one of the things it hinges on, and it's like, well, Leonardo didn't even give the painting that name, so obviously he didn't put a secret code there. Next thing in the film, right? You, and you've probably seen it in the trailers. They look at a painting with a UV light, and it says "so dark, the con of man." And you're thinking, what does that mean? And it turns out it's a secret code, right? And if you get all these letters of "so dark, the con of man" and jumble them up, right? And if you're very clever, you will come up with this: Madonna on the rocks. Now, it's nothing about the pop star Madonna, okay? Right. What it is, though, is he claims it's this painting. 
okay, which is at the Louvre Museum in France. And he calls it Madonna on the Rocks. And in the film and in the book, it's a sign to these people that they need to get hold of this painting and they need to find out something secret about the painting or around the painting. There's a big problem with this, right? Remember, he calls it Madonna on the Rocks. The painting's called Virgin on the Rocks, okay? So once again, there is, there's no secret code here. Dan Brown changes the name of a painting so that he can make his anagram work. Really, the painting should be called Virgin on the Rocks. The other interesting thing is, uh, it'd be interesting to see how they do it in the film, but this, the, the French girl, you've probably seen her in the trailers, she manages to pick up this painting and she threatens to destroy it. Now, you look at the size of that painting, you think that would have to be a pretty strong woman to, to pick that up. Plus, she, she bends it as well, but there's, there's glass on the front of it, so it wouldn't be possible to bend. But anyway, so again, he's changed the names of paintings there. You probably heard this going on all kinds of documentaries about this, the painting of the Last Supper. And in the Da Vinci Code, he claims that John, who's the guy sitting to the left of Jesus, is really a woman because he's got long hair. Although if you look at that painting, you'll see a lot of people with long hair. And what he says on page 243 of the book is that there's the hint of a bosom. In John. He says you can see a line which shows that John isn't John. It's really Mary Magdalene. That's what he claims. Now, interesting theory, but and remember he said all descriptions of artwork are accurate, but the problem is that hint of a bosom is actually a crack in the paint. You wouldn't have found it when Leonardo painted it in the 1500s. It's just the way the pack has, the, the pack, it's just the way the paint has cracked now, and it actually runs from his neck, so it's quite clear it's not a bosom. The other thing to note is, in Florence, painters painted men effeminately in these times. If you look at Leonardo's painting of St. John the Baptist, that does look very effeminate. But it's not supposed to be a woman, it's not Mary Magdalene. It's just a painting of a, another guy called John the Baptist, which is different to John in the Last Supper. So when you hear them say, oh, he looks like a woman, you just say, look, that was a style in those days. In Florence, they painted a lot of young men as women, especially John the Disciple. They liked doing that because he was the youngest, and that was the way they painted him. So that was artwork. We've seen that. It's not accurate. Now we're going to look at the second one, which is architecture. Remember, page one. All descriptions of architecture in this novel are accurate. Now, let's check it out, see if that's true. That's the Louvre Museum. And in the middle, you can see you've got this pyramid. Quite an interesting structure. Now, Dan Brown says it's got 666 panes of glass on it. And he hints there's something unusual about that because 666 obviously has links with the devil. Now, you might think, that's weird. Why would someone build it with 666 panes? But then if you look it up, you'll find it actually has 673 panes. But Dan Brown told us that all the descriptions of architecture are accurate. Well, here he's not being accurate. So there's nothing satanic about this pyramid here. Then in the book, page 131, he says, no trip to the Mona Lisa had been complete without her grandfather dragging her across the room to see this second painting. And what he's saying is that the Mona Lisa on the left there and the Virgin on the Rocks on the right there, which remember he calls it the Madonna on the Rocks, he's making it sound like they're in the same room. Now check it out. If you look at a map of the Louvre, you'll see they're in completely different places. And bear in mind, this is one of the longest buildings in the world. The perimeter is about three miles. So to walk from the Virgin on the Rocks to the Mona Lisa is quite some difference. So you can see the architecture is wrong here. Also in the film he describes, and in the book he describes an office of uh, the guy who dies at the beginning called Jack, and the office is quite near the Virgin on the Rocks there. In fact, if you go to the Louvre, you'll see there's no office there whatsoever. Then he talks about this place called Saint Sulpice. Sorry if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, now here he says there's a, a woman who lives in this church, right, um, in a room in the church. Now, there, there is no room in the church where a woman could live. So that's inaccurate. But to make things worse, he then in the film has her standing on a balcony that doesn't exist. <laughs> there isn't really a balcony in this church. And uh, when you read it in a book, you see she's watching this guy from the balcony. Well, she, she couldn't have because there's no balcony there. 
You can go to this place today and see it. Um, then on the floor of this church, there's this, that line running down the floor with a square at the end. This is called a gnomon. And this is what they used for telling what time Easter was. The sun, on Easter, the sun would shine down through it and you could tell, ah, this is Easter time now. Remember, they didn't have digital watches back in those days, okay? Now, in the Da Vinci Code, right, they claim that this is left over from a pagan temple. Sounds all very exciting. And they, he says, this church was built on top of an old pagan temple and this was left, leftovers from the pagan temple. The problem is... This was actually added to the church in 1727. The church was built first, and then they added the gnomon. So it wasn't a leftover of a pagan temple. In fact, there's no evidence there ever was a pagan temple there. He also calls this, this line here, he says, this is the Paris Meridian. Just like in Greenwich, we have Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, he claims this is the Paris Meridian, but he's really 100 meters out. Now, you might think I'm being picky, but seeing as the man says on the front sleeve and on the front page of his book that all references, all descriptions of architecture are accurate, it's worth pointing out that actually they're not accurate. Then we've got Rosalind Chapel. This is in Scotland. And hundreds of people visit this place every day ever since the book came out. They want to see the stuff he talks about, but they're going to be pretty disappointed because to start off with, he says there's a big Star of David worn into the floor in the chapel. Well, there isn't a Star of David on the floor. He just made it up. So some people travel all the way up to Scotland, look for this Star of David on the floor. It isn't there. He also says there's an underground vault. Well, no one's found this underground vault yet. And with hundreds of people going there every day, you would have thought they found it by now. He also says it's built on the site of a Mithraic temple. Now, there's absolutely no evidence for that at all. He just made that up. Um, and... Fourth point, he says it's an exact copy of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Now, Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, right? That is 2,500 and something years ago. We, it's a long time ago. It's a long time ago, and we don't know exactly what it looked like. We've got an idea, but one thing we do know for sure is it doesn't look like this building here. It doesn't look anything like something built in 586 BC. So lots of mistakes there in the architecture. We're now going to move on to the final thing we're going to look at, documents. Remember, he claims all descriptions of documents in this novel are accurate. Now, he's been wrong with artwork. He's blatantly made stuff up. He's been wrong with architecture. So we would expect he's probably going to be wrong with documents as well. Let's have a look. Page 245 in the book, it says, These are photocopies of the Nag Hammadi and Dead Sea Scrolls, which I mentioned earlier, Tebing said, the earliest Christian records. Now, this is a really big mistake here, right? Calling the Nag Hammadi and the Dead Sea Scrolls the earliest Christian records. For starters, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is no Christian documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay? It was a Jewish community that wrote it. Uh, wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you've got a lot of the Old Testament in there. In fact, almost every book of the Old Testament. You've got Jewish literature in there. You've even got, and I'm surprised they haven't put it in a book, they found instructions of how to find treasure in the desert. Now, either there isn't really any treasure there in the desert, or um, someone's already found it and taken it. But I'm surprised they didn't put it in a book, because that's quite interesting. It's almost like Indiana Jones. They really did find instructions of how to dig up some treasure somewhere in the desert. But nothing about Jesus. No Christian records at all. Next thing, the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, they're dated much later than the New Testament manuscripts. When I say New Testament, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the books you find in the second half of the Bible. So when he says it's the earliest Christian records, that is a big, big mistake. Check it out. You all know that Jesus was born round about the year zero, zero AD. But imagine if Jesus had been born around the year 1900, just to put it in today's perspective so you can get an idea when these manuscripts were written. Jesus is born around the year 1900. Now, Jesus was round Jerusalem as a little boy, Right, going to visit the temple, round about the time the Titanic sank. So if you've seen the film Titanic, just picture what kind of clothes people were wearing there, and then you get an idea how long ago that was, right? Jesus has a little boy round about those times. Then you've got Jesus' death and resurrection in 1930. 
okay, quite a long time ago. Then you got the first New Testament writings were finished at the close, by the close of World War II. Still a long time ago, but pretty close to Jesus' death and resurrection. 1945, okay? Right? Um, sorry, let me correct what I just said. The first New Testament writings were written at the close of World War II. So around about 1945, you got the first New Testament writings being written within 15 years of Jesus dying, right? Then you got the first New Testament gospel around 1960. This we would believe to be the Gospel of Mark, okay? So about 30 years after Jesus dies, one of his followers writes a gospel about Jesus' life. Then you got the last New Testament gospel written about 1990, and we reckon this would be the Gospel of John, okay? So we could see this is when the Gospels are all finished, within 60 years of Jesus dying, and within 90 years of Jesus being born, okay? Now, the Gospel of Thomas, which is one of these Gnostic Gospels, which someone like Dan Brown would want us to believe are earlier than the New Testament Gospels, this wasn't written until 2030. Now, we haven't even got to 2030 yet. So you've got to think, is that really earlier than the New Testament Gospels? You know, this is, and can we really trust it? Because this is a guy writing a book pretending he was Thomas, who rolled with Jesus, and Thomas was long dead. <laughs> he wouldn't still be alive in 2030. So I'm not going to trust a book written by someone who pretends there's someone else. But check out another one, that so-called Gospel of Mary would be written around 2050. That hasn't even happened yet, so we know that ain't Mary who was rolling with Jesus. And then you've got the Gospel of Philip, another Gnostic Gospel, written around 2170. Right? That's 270 years after Jesus was born. So when in the Da Vinci Code it says that these Gnostic Gospels he's got, and he holds this book with photocopies called the Gnostic Gospels, and when he claims these are the earliest, just remember these numbers here and think, nah, Thomas, Mary, and Philip, they were all written incredibly late. They're not written before the New Testament was written. Now, when he's talking about the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Magdalene, there's a character in a book called Teabing. He's quite a character, right? He's the old gentleman in it. And he says, according to these unaltered Gospels, and he's claiming that these late Gospels, Gospel of Philip and Gospel of Mary, are unaltered. But the problem here is, like I just pointed out, they weren't written until long after Philip and Mary were dead. So it don't matter whether they're altered or not. The point is, they were written after these people live, so they're not going to be reliable. The next thing is, there's not nearly as much textual evidence as the New Testament Gospels. With the New Testament, we've got documents from round about 100 AD. Then we've got documents from 200 AD, 300 AD, 400 AD. We've got manuscripts running all the way up to when we got the printing press and people stopped writing manuscripts and started typing everything up like we do these days on computers. And when we look at these manuscripts, we find that there aren't any significant differences between them, which means we've got a lot of textual evidence to say the Bible we have now is the same Bible people had in the second century. But with these Gospels of Philip and Magdalene, we don't have anywhere near the same amount of evidence. So you can't claim that they're unaltered but you can easily claim the New Testament hasn't been altered. Then we've got him claiming that there were 80 Gospels originally. This guy, Teabing, says, more than 80 Gospels were considered for the New Testament, and yet only a relative few were chosen for inclusion. Now, this is a complete fabrication. Check it out. In the Nag Hammadi Library, which Dan Brown loves talking about, and you'll hear it mentioned in the film, there are only actually five Gospels in this library. And remember, this is, this is stuff that's written much later than the New Testament anyway. But there's only five books in it that are called Gospels. Now, where you get the number 80 from five, I do not know. Um, but there's only five named Gospels in the Nag Hammadi Library, and they're all fake. Next thing to note is that there's no record of even the authors of these Gospels wanting them in the Bible. And that's quite significant because Dan Brown's claiming there's a conspiracy and people didn't want these books in. And yet, there's no record of the writers of these Gospels or any of the Gnostics saying, can we have these in the Bible, please? So they didn't even ask for it to be in the Bible. So it's not a big issue. Now, in the book, page 246, Teabing flipped through the book and this is his photocopy of 
Nag Hammadi manuscripts and pointed out several other passages that to Sophie's surprise clearly suggested Magdalene and Jesus had a romantic relationship. This is what the whole Da Vinci Code hinges on. The idea that Jesus and Mary had a relationship together. Now just the name Magdalene tells you she wasn't married because in those times it was a very male orientated society and women would often be named by the man they were married to or by the place they lived in. The fact that Mary is called Magdalene, which means she's from the town of Magdala, shows that she wasn't married because it would have said Jesus of Mary. But instead it says of Magdalene, so it shows she wasn't married anyway. But what is quite important is in these, these manuscripts that he claims there's many references, there are only two references, two Two references to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. None of them suggest that they're married, but there are two references, and that's in the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary. And this is where the Da Vinci Code gets the whole idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene was married, from two references. And we're going to look at these now so you know what they are. First is in the Gospel of Philip in chapter 63, between the verses 33 to 36. It says, And the companion of the Saviour is Mary Magdalene, Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on her mouth. The rest of the disciples were offended by it and expressed disapproval. They said to him, why do you love her more than all of us? Now, Dan Brown's claiming that this shows they were married. Well, if they were married, his disciples wouldn't have been annoyed about this anyway. But check it out. First big mistake is the word companion. In the book, He says, any Aramaic scholar will tell you the word companion is often translated spouse, meaning someone you're married to. Now, there's a big problem. The Gospel of Philip wasn't written in Aramaic. (laughs) Okay, that's a big mistake. He said in his book that all the uh, descriptions, documents are accurate. And he's calling this Gospel here Aramaic. It's written in Coptic, okay, which is not Aramaic. It's a different language. And the word companion here is actually a Greek word. It's called a loan word. They used a Greek word in the language, just like sometimes we might use a French word to say something like uh, double entendre or something like that. So it's a Greek word. And the, the thing is, the Greek word, it can be translated spouse, but more often it means spiritual sister. And there's no Aramaic word, I believe, that can actually be translated companion and spouse anyway. So that's a real big mistake he's put there. Next thing is where he says the word for mouth is actually missing in the manuscript. The copy of the manuscript we have says, used to kiss her often on the blank. It doesn't say mouth. It might be saying head. Originally it might have said he used to kiss her on the head. It might be saying he kissed her on the cheek. Could be he kissed her on the hand. Now in those days, the Christians would actually greet one another with a kiss anyway. So culturally, it wouldn't have been bad to kiss someone on the mouth. These days, you don't go up in the shopping center and kiss someone on the mouth and say, hi, how are you doing? Uh, you know, let's say your girlfriend. But in those times, it wouldn't have been uncommon. But the point is, Dan Brown is being dishonest when he says that he says he used to kiss her on the mouth because we really don't know what he would say. Now, remember, I said there's only two references to Jesus and Mary. This is the second one now. Gospel of Mary, chapter 17. When Mary had said this, she was silent, since the Saviour had spoken thus far with her. But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, Say what you think concerning what she said, for I do not believe that the Saviour said this, for certainly these teachings are of other ideas. Peter also opposed her in regard to these matters and asked them about the Saviour. Did he then speak secretly with a woman in preference to us and not openly? Are we to turn back and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Then Mary grieved and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I thought this up myself in my heart or that I am lying concerning the Saviour? That is the second reference to Mary Madeline. Now, what Dan Brown gets from this is that Mary and Jesus were married and that Mary was given secret information to start the church and to run the church. And it's all based on this. You know, that's, that's a, you know, it's crazy because people read the book and they think, yeah, it's true. But when you check out the facts, you see, well, no, it's not really. Um, where is the marriage and the romance in this passage? I don't see it. I don't know if Dan Brown's got a funny idea of romance. But the other thing is, 
These are the only two references to any kind of relationship between Jesus and Mary. There's nothing else to say they were married. Yet in the book it keeps saying there's loads of references to say they were married. Now, he also talks about the Council of Nicaea. And as this is documented, we could, I think, include this in his description of documents. He says on page 233, this is uh, Tebing. Jesus' establishment as a son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea. Hold on, you're saying Jesus' divinity was the result of a vote? A relatively close vote at that, Teabing added. Here, Dan Brown makes the argument that no one believed Jesus was the son of God until the Emperor Constantine held the Council of Nicaea and then they voted and said, what do you think? And then at a very close vote, they said, yeah, okay, he is son of God. Now, there's problems with this. Problem is the church had already worshipped Jesus as a son of God from the time just before Jesus was crucified. Okay? His disciples worshipped him as that and afterwards. And for 300 years, people were worshipping Jesus as a son of God. The church was actually getting persecuted for their faith. They were getting killed. You know, people would get stopped by soldiers. And if they didn't worship the emperor, they would then be killed because they believed Jesus was the Son of God and they would only worship Jesus. So that, that's a big mistake. But the other problem here is, he says it's a close vote. Now there's about 318 bishops who took part in this vote and only two of them voted against Jesus' divinity. And the only reason why they had the vote, right, was because there was a guy called Arius at the time who was a bit confused. How could Jesus have been a man and how could Jesus be God? So what Arius said was, Jesus must have been more than a man. But then he thought, out of respect to God, he was like, Jesus couldn't be as important as God. So what Arius said was, Jesus was less than God, but more than a man. So you've got God here, man there, Jesus is somewhere in between. Now, he's wrong, but he started telling people this idea. And a lot of people were confused about how Jesus could be man and God at the same time. And so they started talking about it, and they say that back then you couldn't buy a loaf of bread without someone talking about this. And what Arius did was he actually made songs about it. Like these days, you've got pop songs on top of the pops, where Arius made these songs that everyone started singing. And at the Council of Nicaea, he even started singing one of these songs. Imagine that. Big, important trial. You've got like Tony Blair on trial. And they say, Tony Blair, did you really believe there were weapons of mass destruction? And Tony Blair goes, well, I'll tell you a song. You know, that that was how it was. Arius started singing this song. And this was how the idea got around. Everyone's singing these songs, singing that Jesus isn't quite as important as God, but he's more important than man. So the church were like, hey, this is wrong. Let's, Let's get together and talk about this. And let's make it clear what we believe. And they took a vote. And two funny people said, no, we're going to vote in favor of Arius. But... 316 guys didn't, so it wasn't a close vote. So again, a big mistake. So when you see this in the film, remember, that is not true. Now, in the book, they talk a lot about Jesus' humanity. And what they claim is that the church has tried to deny Jesus' humanity, but the Gnostics are the guys who really admitted Jesus' humanity, which is actually the reverse. Um, T. Bing says on page 244, any gospels that describe the earthly aspects of Jesus' life had to be omitted from the Bible. So he's claiming that in the Bible we have that he says is corrupted, there aren't any verses about Jesus' humanity. Okay, and this is the last thing we're going to look at. So let's have a look. In the Bible we have today, John 4, 6, and this is a manuscript, this is a verse that we've had for 2,000 years almost, okay? John 4, 6, it says, Jesus, since he was tired from the journey, sat down beside the well. Well, I think it's quite obvious that's talking of his humanity. That's saying Jesus was a human. He sat down because he was tired. We all know what that feels like. You sit down because you're tired. Talking of Jesus' humanity, show you another one. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. This is when his friend Lazarus had died. And everyone was really sad about it. And Jesus turned up on the scene and he saw how distraught people were. And he knew his friend had died and he burst into tears. Again, this is speaking of Jesus' humanity. These verses haven't been taken out of the Bible. Then you got when Jesus was crucified. John 18, verse 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, realizing that by this time everything was completed, said, in order to fulfill the scripture, 
I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was there, so they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a branch of hyssop and lifted it to his mouth. When he had received the sour wine, Jesus said, it is completed. Now notice Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, he said he was thirsty. Like we get thirsty. This shows us Jesus was fully human. He was also fully God, but he was fully human. And these verses were not taken out of the Bible. The Gnostics were actually the guys that made the fake gospels and said that Jesus wasn't a man. That the guy on the cross was some other person and Jesus was only a spirit. So the Da Vinci Code's got it completely wrong. Christians believe Jesus was fully God and fully man. Now check this out. After Jesus had been on the cross for a long time, John 15, 33 to 34, this is what it says in the Bible. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and blood and water flowed out immediately. Now, they wanted to make sure Jesus was dead. And when they put the spear in him and blood and water flowed out, what that shows us is that they pierced the pericardium, which is the the sac that the heart is inside. So the water came out and it pierced the heart and the blood came out. So this is blatantly speaking of Jesus' humanity. And this is the Gospel of John that we reckon was written around about AD 90, long before all these fake Gospels in the Da Vinci Code. Okay? This speaks of Jesus' humanity, that he actually died for us, and that to show that he was human, they actually saw that the pericardium and the heart had been punctured and blood and water flowed out. So Jesus was human. Now this is the thing. This shows us what their real cover-up is. Now, Dan Brown says the church has done a cover-up. But what's really happened is Dan Brown's done a cover-up in the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, what he's trying to cover up is that Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, died on the cross. He died on the cross for everyone's wrongdoings. And this is tragic because a lot of people think, ah, the film's a good laugh. And people may well get entertainment out of it. But ultimately, what Dan Brown's doing is covering up the death of a great man and a great God who died for people. So that's where the real cover-up is. It's not the church. We found Dan Brown's been wrong about artwork, architecture, and documents. And we haven't even looked at what he said about secret rituals. We don't even have to bother with that. But what he's done throughout the book is try and cover up what Jesus has done. So, let's make sure that we don't get deceived like 20 million people supposedly have in believing everything in the Da Vinci Code is true. Check out the facts for yourselves. Read the Bible. You can trust the Bible, see it's true, and know that this man, who is also God, Jesus Christ, died for all your sins. There's more evidence about the death of Jesus than there is about anyone else in history dying. We know more about Jesus' death than we know about Julius Caesar's death. But Dan Brown tries to make us think there's a cover-up. But the fact is, Jesus did die, and we believe Jesus died for all our sins. So anyone got any questions? Any questions about Da Vinci Code, or about the Bible, or about Jesus? No questions? Have you got a question? Aaron, you got a question? Dave? Uh, Dan Brown quotes the Old Testament at one point. It's interesting because he quotes the Old Testament and he talks about the creation story. And then he says, this is what the Christians have done. And it shows his agenda because he doesn't say this, is, this was a Jewish book for 1,500 years before Jesus was born. He just straight away says, this is what the Christians done. They changed it. So we see there is an agenda to make Christians look bad. Any other questions? Okay, next week, Clem. I've actually yeah. seen a book or seen a film. Mm. Is, it, is it a book saying about Antichrist or something? Is it to say, well, there wasn't a Jesus? Or okay, yeah. Good question. The story behind the book, really, right, is that Jesus did live, but then Jesus married Mary Magdalene, and they had a child. And this child 
then you can follow the bloodline of this child right through to someone living today. They say someone is the heir of Jesus. And it's kind of irrelevant because at the same time the story is saying we should worship the divine feminine. And the way we do that is through sex, basically. Uh, so it, yeah, it's a really bad book, really, what it's teaching. Um, that, that's basically it. And what it takes away from is the fact that Jesus died on a cross for, for people's sins. And the, the fact that it doesn't tell you what to do with your life. Like we all know we do wrong things every day. And one day we're going to meet our creator and have to say sorry. Now, if we've accepted what Jesus did for us on the cross, when we meet God, we can know that our sins have been paid for by what Jesus did for us. But in the Da Vinci Code, it doesn't say anything about that. It just says, look, when you have sex... Remember, you're getting in touch with the divine feminine. And that's it. Don't, don't tell you anything else. That doesn't help you with life. Now, I don't know about you lot, but I know life can be hard. And, you know, that, the Da Vinci Code does not give me the answers to life. Does that answer your question, or you got more questions now? Um, mm. in, the, in the book, what happens is you've got these guys running around looking at all these clues and as they find the clues they find what they believe is a big cover up that this whole Mary Magdalene thing has been hidden and the only way you can find it out is by looking at the artwork and seeing the secret codes in the artwork and then you find out aha Mary Magdalene had a child and at the end they find out who the the child is but they don't do anything about it it's pretty silly really No, it really, it takes the focus off Jesus completely, puts it all on Mary Magdalene, um, which I think Mary Magdalene would be disgusted about because she was a, a big follower of Jesus. And to know that then people are talking about her all the time instead of Jesus is pretty, pretty bad. So there, there's nothing in the book that points people to Jesus. In fact, Jesus is just, if you like, Jesus is just someone who in the book he says, basically created a, a child with Mary. That's Jesus' only purpose, really. Yeah. Why do you think the book and the film are so popular? I think they're popular because it's all conspiracy theory and people love conspiracy theories. I think as well, people love any bit of information that tells them that it isn't true about Jesus. Yeah, it's <laughs> for, yeah. for 2,000 years, people have tried to disprove the Bible and they've never been able to do it. There were some Germans who thought they did it a few years ago and then some archaeologists found stuff that basically meant loads of German literature got burned because it, it wasn't true anymore. Um, and uh, I think ultimately it is what the devil is putting out there to try and get people to not know about Jesus who died for them. Deepa. Does he in the book make a distinction between Christians and not agnostics? Or is he and, trying to say that? Well, a distinction between Christians and Gnostics. Yeah. In the book... He tries to make out that Christians and Gnostics were pretty much the same and that the, uh, there were just some guys that didn't like the Gnostic books. If you study church history and read the Gnostic Gospels, you'll see Gnosticism and Christianity were worlds apart and the Gnostics denied that Jesus was a man. Gnostic. Good question. Gnostics were a group of people that came, came about saying it's all about secret knowledge. So Christians believe that it's about knowing Jesus. Gnostics believed it was about secret knowledge. And this is one of my problems with the book. It, we believe Jesus died for everyone here in this room. Gnostics will say, and the Da Vinci Code says that, one or two of you in this room, if you're intellectual, you could find the secret knowledge. And when you find the secret knowledge, you'll be all right. You know, and what it means is if, I, if I'm a bit thick, I, I can't get in. You know, but, but the thing is, it's very hypocritical as well because Dan Brown claims that the Gnostics were very into women and that they promoted women's rights. Now, when we look at history, we see it was the church in the early days that promoted women's rights because Jewish culture back then was quite sexist. They weren't nice to women. Do you know what men would pray in the morning? They'd say, thank you, God, that I'm a Jew and not a non-Jew and thank you that I'm not a woman. That, that was their view of women. Now Jesus came along and started talking to women and started showing respect and love to women and telling husbands that they needed to love their wives in a different way to how they had been loving them. 
But the Gnostic Gospels say that Mary couldn't get into heaven without being turned into a man first. So in the Gnostic Gospels, it doesn't say Mary Magdalene was this divine feminine. It says Jesus was going to turn her into a man so she could get into heaven. I mean, it's ridiculous. In a way, I guess you could say that. Or, or apart from the women that have been converted into men so they can get into heaven. It's crazy. Jordan. Yeah, Dan Brown says that it says in these Gnostic Gospels that Mary Magdalene was supposed to become the head of the church. But I've showed you the two references to Mary Magdalene, so there's no historical record of that. Could you explain a bit about uh, Gnosticism theology, about why they denied that Jesus was a man? Yeah, Gnostics believed, and it's very hard to say what they believed because there were so many different Gnostics. But if I can try and summarize my understanding of it, they believed that there were lots of gods at the beginning and there was one evil God who created the world. Okay? They said there was an evil God who created the world. And the reason why he was evil was because he created matter. Like, that's matter. Anything solid is matter. Anything flesh is matter. And what the Gnostics said was only spiritual things are good. Anything fleshly is bad. Right? Which is why they then said Jesus wasn't really a man. He was only a spirit. And there was someone else's body that was used as a, as a cloak for Jesus. Right. Someone else's body. I don't know how that works out as well. Um, but everything is spiritual. Now, the way that this got used was then people said, I can do what I want with my body because my body's evil anyway. So I can sleep around with as many people as I want because really it's all about spiritual matters. My body is already evil, so it's my spirit that counts and not my body. Now, if you do that, we can all go around murdering anyone we want like this poor 15-year-old boy who got murdered the other day outside school. And we can say, it wasn't me, it was my body. Which I think we all agree is, is pretty ridiculous. So what Christians believe is that we do have a spirit and we have a body. And when we go to heaven, we will get a resurrected body. So if any of you got a bad back or a bad leg or anything like that, when we go to heaven, we get a new body, everything works. So we don't try to separate the body from the spiritual, although obviously we focus more on the spiritual, because this body is going to disappear one day. We're going to get a new body. Uh, yes, mate? Why is the number 666? Good question. 666. It says in the last book of the Bible, which is called Revelation, it's a prophecy about the future, and it says that one day no one's going to be able to buy or sell anything without the mark of the beast, and it says the mark of the beast... Sorry, the number of the beast is 666. Now it says we have to have this mark on either our hand or on our head. Now this is very interesting because it says we can't buy or sell anything without this mark on our hand or our head. Now you know these days we use credit cards and you've got chip and pin. You see people type in their numbers. What they're talking about, and I was actually a lecture, at a lecture where the guy who ran this big company talked about this and he was saying that what they want to do now is put chips in your hand so that when you go to buy something, instead of doing chip and pin, you just put your hand under the scanner, zoom, and then you've bought your can of Coke or your bag of chips. Now, it's very interesting because the Bible says one day you'll have to have a mark, and then it says it's the mark of the beast, and it says the number of the beast is 666. So that means you can buy anything. You buy anything, but here's the catch. That mark says that you show allegiance to who's called the beast in the Bible, which is the Antichrist. And he's going to be a ruler of the whole world. Yeah, you're going to run the whole world and people are going to follow him. And the way they follow him is by getting a mark on their hand. Right, so what it says in the Bible is if you're a Christian, you shouldn't get that mark because you're only going to worship God. You're not going to follow this leader. He's going to seem to be a good man at first and then he's going to be an evil man. So that's what the number 666 is about. If you don't follow him, he will want to kill you. That's what it says. It says they're going to kill all the Christians, or try to kill them anyway, and the Christians aren't going to take the mark. So for Christians, it will be like, how do I get my food? And it will be a difficult decision. But the thing is, do you sell out because you're hungry, or do you say, no, I'm going to stay true to God and follow him? These Christians, for the first 200 years after Jesus' death, they were getting killed for their faith. And they said, no, I'm not going to worship the emperor. So we believe that if anyone says, take a mark on your hand or your head, that you shouldn't do it.
Dave. Go on, Clem. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. That's very wise, and and that's why I think we want to be aware of that and ready. And ultimately, the thing is, pray every day. Trust God for your finances, even though you know you got money in the bank. You don't know at what day someone will say, you can only get this money out now when you get a chip in your hand. And by the way, they're already putting chips in children in America. I bet you lot wouldn't like a chip in your head. But they're doing that in America with rich families, because you know sometimes people kidnap a child of a rich family to get ransom money. So what they've been doing is putting chips in these kids, and they've actually managed to rescue a lot of kids from it, because they say we could track them down with the chip. The police track down where the kids are hidden and get them out. They're using that as one of the sales ploys. At this lecture I was at, the guy was saying this is a good thing, and he was telling us how a lot of diplomats have chips in them. So maybe Tony Blair's got one in case he ever gets kidnapped, and then they track him down and rescue yeah, him. Is that now that worries me as well? If I have a chip in my hand, and someone wants to steal my money out of my bank account, they're going to chop my hand off, aren't they? So. Uh, I, I'll keep cash in my pocket, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you've got a chip in you, the government can know where you are, exactly. Exactly. Um, any other questions about Da Vinci Code? Doesn't Dan Brown make a big mistake when he's saying that the early Christians only believed Jesus was mortal? Yeah. The agnostic Gospels show that Jesus was just human. And yet when we actually check the theology of uh, Gnosticism, they believed that the body is evil. They didn't actually believe that he was human. Yeah. They believed that he was spiritual. Exactly. Isn't it that he's doing, he's doing the wrong yeah. he's, he's contradicting them. Yeah, you're right. Da Vinci Code tells the opposite to the truth in many cases. It says that the Christians didn't believe Jesus was human, where the fact is Christians believed he was 100% human, 100% God. Okay? Now, he also said, although some people didn't understand that, People did spend quite a while trying to work it out, how does this work, which is why they had the vote at Nicaea. Because they were like, how can Jesus be human and God at the same time? Um, but Gnostics were the guys who said Jesus wasn't human at all. Now, it's important for us to know Jesus was human because he had to make a sacrifice on behalf of us. He had to represent us. But the other thing is, because he was human, he's lived the same life all of us have lived. So we can identify with Jesus. When we've got friends who have died and we're sad about friends who have died, we can pray to Jesus, because remember it said Jesus wept, his friend Lazarus had died. So you can pray to Jesus and know that he identifies with you if you're sad about someone dying. The other thing we know is Jesus grew up in a very bad area. He grew up in Nazareth, which would have been a real ghetto area then. So we can go to Jesus and pray and say, I'm having trouble with this and that, and Jesus knows where we're coming from. Jesus really was from the streets. So it's important that we know he was human, he's been through everything we've been through. Jordan. That's right, yeah. Dan Brown says that at Nicaea they decided what books would go in the Bible. Uh, that didn't happen at all. And we're going to look at that next week. Next week we're going to look at how do we get the Bible so that when you hear me teaching from the Bible on Sundays, then you know where the, how we actually got the Bible. And it's very important that every person knows how we got the Bible. Because you don't just want to see something on paper and say, yeah, that's the truth. You want to be able, especially now, like now that this film's come out, everyone's going to be asking you, how do you know the Bible's true? And we need to be able to say to them, I know because blah, blah, blah. You've got to just look at something and say you believe That's right. So, so next week, I'm going to give you some evidence up on the screen. I'm even going to show you manuscripts on the screen so you can see the proof for yourself. But then after that, we're going to go back to what we normally do on Sundays, where we do Bible teaching. Uh, which I think is probably more fun, but I think for this week and next week, it's just important we know this, because when we was at the shopping centre, I mean, boy, it was just interesting chatting to people, so many people being led astray by this, and we don't want to see people going to hell. We want to rescue people from that, so it's important we know the truth.